pictures and whole bundles of prints and drawings, and a mass of contradictions. Rubens, the devout Catholic, the most important religious artist of the Baroque age. Rubens, the luxuriant painter of passion. Rubens, the cultured humanist, the citizen of Europe, the diplomat and entrepreneur. Rubens, the vigorous wild flame. Certainly Rubens is one of the great storytellers in the history of art, if not the greatest. But some would say he's just the creator of an overripe aesthetic, now justifiably looked down upon with a condescending smile. Skin, flesh, clouds and rolling eyes, floating knotted clusters of naked men and women, a torrent of human bodies, the ecstasy of bliss and terror. The Last Judgment, a composition of immense size, six meters high, a triumphal redemption entirely in the spirit of the Counter-Reformation. Bliss tenderness, grace, sensuousness, abundance. What Rubens painted was the atmosphere of his age, his rich fantasy which gave the highest expression to Baroque painting. The Last Judgment, a picture from the heyday of its era, a picture which gave offense in the Jesuit church at Neuburg on the Danube in provincial southern Germany. A smaller version of The Last Judgment depicts the damned, sinful bodies, naked flesh, rejected, deprived of everything, abandoned by God. Bodies grabbed by demons, put on display, stripped of everything, not least of all their dignity. All human life is here, nothing is spared, nothing is idealized. In this picture, there's no redemption, no programmatic Catholic ideal, only despair and damnation. Who was this Rubens? Surprisingly, the self-portraits confront us with an insurmountable barrier. Rubens the inaccessible, the disciplined master of his own self. Though Peter Paul was born in Siegen near Cologne in 1577, the Rubens family came from Antwerp in what was then the Catholic Spanish Netherlands. His father, a Protestant lawyer named Jan Rubens, had been forced to flee to Germany. He died when young Rubens was 12 and the family returned to Antwerp. Rubens' first teachers were the painters Tobias Verhecht and Otto van Veen. But for his great artistic talent, even Antwerp, in those days larger than London or Paris, was too small. He set off for Italy. At the age of 23, he arrived at the court of Duke Vincenzo Gonzaga in Mantua. This town played an important role in the Renaissance culture of the 16th century. The Gonzaga court was a focus of northern Italian painting. Rubens owed his reception at court not just to his artistic talent, but evidently also to his charming manner and humanist education. He embodied the ideal of the young courtier. And he was self-assured to match. This friendship painting depicts the painter in a circle of important people, such as the philosopher Justus Lipsius, 
Rubens gazes confidently out of the picture, young, ambitious, convinced of his abilities, the humanist ideal. He now studied, drew and copied everything in Italian art he could set his eyes on, especially Titian. For the Gonzagas, he painted a copy of a portrait by Titian of Isabella d'Este, soft, gentle and luxurious. Rome was experiencing the birth of the Baroque as a second renaissance. It was the time of Pope Paul V from the Borghese dynasty. Social life was characterized by luxury and display. Rubens stayed in Rome for almost four years. He studied the work of Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel. In his own treatments of the latter's Last Judgment, he took up the balanced relationship of gesture and contact, the coils and curves of the heavy entangled and knotted bodies, and developed it in masterly fashion. His study of Raphael was no less intensive. The transfiguration of Christ was one motif he would go on to paint himself. The need for help, promise and salvation, fear, pity and hope, these are Raphael's themes here. Rubens' worldview was formed by the idea of certain redemption. Titian and Tintoretto painted in soft color mixtures, quite unlike Caravaggio, an empty stage, a style of lighting in which deep dark tones are torn apart by dazzling light contrasts. The bodies are covered with patches of light. This alone lends them their sculptural quality, a further revelation for Rubens. We could pursue this list of great exemplars much further. Rubens stood on the shoulders of giants, developing his talents and a style of his own. He built a bridge between northern and southern Europe, between Italian and Flemish painting. Rubens left Rome in 1608 and returned to Antwerp. Immediately on his return, he painted the Adoration of the Magi for Antwerp City Hall. Soft materials and splendid color, as with Titian. The power of the light emanating from the Christ child follows Raphael, or Caravaggio, in the way it formulates devotion and glory. The porters at the side display their muscles in the manner of Michelangelo, not without the touch of exaggeration typical of Rubens. Commissioned to mark the signing of the truce between Spain and those Dutch provinces which had broken away from Spanish rule, the picture was intended to express a yearning for peace. Ruben's life took a similarly dramatic and dynamic course to that of his pictorial compositions. In the summer of 1609, he married Isabella Brunt, the daughter of an Antwerp patrician, and soon moved into a large house of his own, which in the years to come he enlarged into something resembling a palace with a large studio. On his return to Antwerp, Rubens had been appointed court painter to Archduke Albrecht, the Spanish regent, but he secured a term in his contract, allowing him to live and work in Antwerp rather than at the seat of government in Brussels. This reflects his civic pride. After all, his father had been mayor of Antwerp, the richest city in Europe. Rubens' studio quickly became the largest artistic business of the age. The painter and his young wife in the honeysuckle bower. The honeysuckle is the symbol of the marriage knot. It's the details which reveal the extent of Rubens' ability and harmonious, intensive coloration, meticulous nuances, and always the little irregularities that distinguish the real professional. The hands laid one upon the other signify that the marriage has been consummated. Love and affection, the emotional plane, are combined with the symbolism of reason and status. The woman sits in the foreground, but lower down than the man. 
the woman in the role of partner, the indispensable support for her husband, yet subordinate to him.